Well, this is an honor for me to, to uh, be able to introduce a good friend of mine and a colleague and uh, someone I've learned a great deal from. I like to call him a mentor uh, in a certain respect, uh, Wayne May. He's a Wisconsin native. He's always lived there, I believe, and he's a convert to the church. And uh, he's somebody who introduced me to this concept of Book of Mormon in a way that I had never experienced. My family grew up uh, with missionary service in South America, and I visited all the ruins down there. And I always, as a child, had kind of a dream of finding the golden plates <laughs> or some other uh, great discovery. And it really was with the uh, influence of, of Brother May that I, I redirected my search uh, to a new area further north. And it's really made a big impact and difference in, in my life. I, I like to use this quote as I introduce uh, this topic and this speaker. And this is a quote by Jeffrey Holland. And he gave this at uh, BYU in a talk called the greatness of the evidence. He said, our testimonies are not dependent on evidence, but not to seek for and not to acknowledge intellectual documentable support for our belief when it is available is to needlessly limit an otherwise st incomparably strong theological position and deny us a unique persuasive vocabulary in the latter-day arena of religious investigation and sectarian debate. That's a lot of big words for me. So in essence, he says, you know, no, we don't rely on archaeology and evidence to prove anything or to build us our to, to give us a testimony. But when those things exist. It would be foolish to not examine them, especially when they can strengthen and reinforce our testimonies that we have. And so that was what he talked about in that wonderful talk, the greatness of the evidence. And he goes on to say, we have so much wonderful evidence supporting the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ in these latter days. And what you're going to learn tonight uh, will reinforce your testimony of the gospel any way you see it. Um, the last thing I want to say is is a classic line from the Star Wars saga. You remember, these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> now think about how the adversary would work. If the adversary knows where the proof of the Book of Mormon, where the evidence of the Book of Mormon was, do you think that he's going to advertise that? You think he's going to publicize that and make it a big, big, you know, neon red light that says, come and look here? Or is he going to say, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Go look somewhere else. Look for big, uh, glorious structures. Anyway, I think you'll be uh, pleased to discover that these might be the droids you're looking for. So with that, Wayne, I'd love to uh, turn the time over to you. And I think you're in for a real treat. Thanks. What do we turn on first? Does it matter? Um, go ahead and start yours, and we will go from there. Okay. All right. Testing. Uh, how are we doing in the back? Okay. Thumbs up. 
Very good. All right. Um, glad to be here tonight. Uh, can you turn that off? Or... Okay, we'll get set up here in a minute. <laughs> okay, I'm glad to be here. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually in town for the uh, um, Book of Mormon uh, conference in uh, Layton, which is uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday of this week. So if you uh, find yourself uh, not busy, come on over. I'd uh, love to have you. A lot of good speakers there. And uh, it'll, be, it'll be fun. Love to have you. Um, I always make sure when I do a fireside to let everybody know um, because of what I'm doing, I want people to be certain that when I joined the church, it had nothing to do with archaeology. I had a spiritual witness. Uh, it was a testimony builder for me, and uh, it, it, was, it was wonderful. And I, I wish I could give it to all my kids, the exact same thing that happened to myself. But uh, I was a studier of what's called the Hopewell culture in America. It just took me 18 years to wake up, and you'll know what I'm talking about just in a minute. But again, what I'm going to show you tonight, I know when I, as I've come out here for so many years, I find out that most people really don't know who the Hopewell are, and it's no fault of yours. It's not taught in our schools about the mound building culture, and there's three principal groups, which you'll see go by. But uh, we're going to focus on the Hopewell, and that's what I'm going to show you tonight and a couple other things. So with that, I'm going to go here. Um, I'm going to cover these five areas. I'm going to give you a little quick introduction, about five or six uh, images. Then we're going to, I'm going to show you where, where I believe Lehigh landed in North America. And I'm going to show the biggest one will be the Hopewell artifacts. And then uh, we'll go into the Hill Camorra for New York and then final remarks. So we'll proceed in, in that order. So right here, I'm going to start off, first of all, what I call Wayne's uh, jump start. And then uh, we'll meet the mound builders and the two hill Camorra theory, rejection of the Book of Mormon by archaeology and anthropology. So with that, here's my jump start. I was in the church for 18 years. I got baptized in 1970. And <clears throat> I, as far as I was concerned, uh, it didn't make any difference, even though I was studying the Hopewell. Um, the church said it took place in Central and South America combined, and that was okay. It didn't matter. But as the years rolled on, as my Hopewell knowledge increased, I began to waver a little only because, but I said, I didn't want to challenge anything. Everything was fine. That's, if that's where it is, that's where it is. So I want you to understand, I'm not here to tear down Central and South America, but I am here to show you what you have missed if you haven't been looking east to the Hopewell. My wife and I, our temple district was Salt Lake City, which is only 1,400 miles in one direction. Uh, we didn't get out here very often, but when we did, we would run down, which used to be all the bookstores, and uh, that's where I'd spend my time. My wife would be in the food storage stores, and most of that stuff is gone today downtown. It's not there anymore, and it's, it was a lot of fun when it was, but we'd throw the stuff in the back of our car, and when it got up to the window, then we knew it was time to go home. And that's pretty much what we did. We couldn't get it in Wisconsin. You know, I mean, this was a big deal to come out here, what we called Happy Valley. We had to come out to Salt Lake and load up. And that's what we did. But I bought this book that you can see up here, The Personal Writings of Joseph Smith. And right now, with all the things going on uh, that the book that the church is putting out on the writings of the church, showing all that early stuff, all that is contained in this book here on Joseph. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm going to read this letter. I'm going to show it to you right here. I'm looking at this here, and when I saw this, this was my aha moment. We arrived this morning in the banks of the Mississippi. We left the eastern part of the state of Ohio, wandering over the plains of the Nephites, recounting occasionally the history of the Book of Mormon, roving over the mounds of that once beloved people of the Lord, picking up their skulls and bones as proof of its divine authenticity, signed Joseph Smith, Jr. I got to tell you guys, when I read this, after 18 years of study, in the church, this was an eye-opener for me. And my wife, she was driving, because I'm looking at the book, and I didn't say anything to her. I just looked over to her, and I, I, I said, Chris, and she's, yeah. I said, Houston, we got a problem. And now some of you might not catch on that, but uh, that's exactly what I said to her, because that's where I, my head was at. And I looked at this here, and I realized that this area where Joseph just walked across identifying the plains was the turf for the Hopewell Nation. 
This is their home. And this is where I've been spending all my time. Turf. And uh, you can see that you can see a little bit of the yellow star underneath the E. That's where Zara Hemley is. And anybody want, anybody want to guess where that red star is? Anybody? That's where I live. Okay. Mound builders, there's three, three principal types. Late Archary Kadena, that's where you're going to find your Jaredites, your Hopewell 550 to 400 AD. That's where you're going to find your Nephites, Mulekites, and Lamanites. And then you've got the later group that comes much later, the Mississippian, post Book of Mormon. Notice that Hopewell ends at 400 AD, and these guys begin at 900 AD. Why the gap? What's going on in North America in Book of Mormon? What happened after the Nephites were destroyed? We had a dark ages, continual warfare. The victors now fell upon themselves to fight for who's going to control everything and what lands, et cetera, et cetera. And what's going on in Europe at 400 AD? The dark ages. Same thing. Very interesting. So the Hopewell culture, as you look at it, you'll find out that it exists from Great Lakes to Florida. That's north and south. It's also from Kansas to New York, west to east. That is the area. And you'll find as you look through it, you see, when you go, if you look at each state where the Hopewell are, the state archaeologists will give you the information for that state. They don't cross state lines. In other words, the guys in Ohio don't work with the guys in Indiana or Pennsylvania. It doesn't happen. And because of that, they treat the Hopewell as separate entities all the way across our country. But the Book of Mormon tells us that it was a nation, one people, one government. And that's what the Book of Mormon does. It's the glue that puts all this stuff together. And that's what I'm trying to show. Look at the timeline parallel. This is the Nephite timeline out of the Book of Mormon. 600 BC, we figured they probably got here about 590, 5, 589, coming by boat. Of course, 385, that is the final battle when everything is over. And then 421, Moroni says, farewell, right? Now, let's take a look at the Hopewell timeline. 550 BC. Every archaeologist, no matter what state you talk to, will tell you the Hopewell are over by 400 AD. Now, isn't that remarkable? Look how well that fits. But that's even not the best news. The best news is this. We didn't do the work. They can't accuse us of planting, right? We've got skin in the game, so we want things to match, but they've done the work. They've matched this up for us. They did all of this, non-LDS academics, and that's terrific. Good news for us. So here's a map of uh, the eastern half of the states. The red dots represent all three of those mound building cultures. And by the 1890s, when the Smithsonian had put this together, they feel this represents maybe 10% of what was here when Columbus arrived in 1492. So, so much has already gone down through urban sprawl, settlements, farming, you name it. It's gone down. And this is what's left. But even with this, we have much. So in 1970, when I was taught, this is how I looked at it. I was taught that Lehi landed somewhere in South America, this Isthmus of Darien. I was taught that the Book of Mormon events took place in North and South America, and that was fine. And I was taught that the Hill Cumorah was somewhere in Central America, and they actually had four hills picked out, and they still don't have one picked today. So you can ask Meso supporters about where's your hill Camorra? you're going to get four answers because they really don't have one they have four that they'd like to have and of course moroni at the end he takes that book of mormon the copy and he has to walk all the way up to what's going to become palmyra new york and bury the plates now in the second hill Camorra. and this is what's known as the two hill Camorra theory this is what has been prevalent for so many years. Oh, and I forgot to tell you guys, it's okay to take pictures with your phone if you like. If you want to shoot the slides, go right ahead. You're certainly welcome to. And uh, I need to make a quick change here. Um, just bear with me one second. Got to hit presenter view. I hit the wrong one. Just hold on. Right there. 
Okay, now let me get caught up here. Okay, there we are. Two Hill Kamar theory. And so this also can become what's called at the uh, Western Hemisphere theory, where you combine the whole thing from Alaska to uh, uh, the tip of uh, Chile. But now today, the prevailing work is this. Here we have, of course, the country, the Mesoamerica supporters for the two hills. They say everything now is taking place in a thousand square mile area represented by that red circle. And that's what we call the Mesoamerica model. The entire history of the Book of Mormon, by their understanding, has taken place within that red circle. So out of respect for the scholars at the BYU, Palmyra supporters took that same thousand square miles and they dropped it on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario because it takes in the Hill Camorra where Joseph found the plates. But as soon as they did that, the Meso guys informed them this doesn't work because you don't have a cultural horizontal archaeology history that supports one people in there for all that time. And they're right. The Hopewell in that area begin at 100 AD and they're done by 400 AD. So they have no one to grab onto to say, well, these are our Nephites. And that's what we call the limited model geography. And then in 1993, after all this study and getting all fired up, I came out with this right here. I said, look, guys, if you're going to use the Hopewell, you can't cherry pick. You got to take the whole thing. You can't just take a piece. And that's what we call our mound builder area. And that's, that's the area we're going to study. And so here's the next question. This is for you guys. What do you think is the reason that our professionals deny the Book of Mormon? Just think about that for a second. Why do they deny the Book of Mormon? I've polled a lot of members of the church. And the first answer that I got, which was a good one, was this. They can't accept that. Well, that's okay. They're not even concerned with this. This is a spiritual thing. We're talking archaeologists, anthropologists. They want physical. They cannot accept the Book of Mormon. It has nothing to do with the first vision. It also has nothing to do with Joseph Smith receiving the plates. They, they don't even care about this. I think you're going to be surprised. Here is the reason they will not accept the Book of Mormon. Ships. Now, that's kind of a stunner, isn't it? How did Lehi get here? Right? They will tell you there is no maritime technology in the ancient world that would allow the people at that time to sail the Pacific or sail the Atlantic. They could only go bumping around the continental edges and stay close to home. They couldn't come across the ocean. So what's taught in our schools is called isolationism. Nobody here before Columbus to mix with the locals. But what we're talking about in the Book of Mormon is called diffusionism. And you guys, by default, are all diffusionists. How many here believe that Lehi got here by a ship? Let me see your hands. Okay, you're in the club. You're automatically diffusionist. You can't get out. You don't believe in isolationism. So what happens is the Jaredites came by barge, our Nephites came by ship, and our Mulekites came by ship. And this drives them crazy. And this is why they will not accept the Book of Mormon. It has nothing to do spiritually. Simply ships. So let's talk about that. And this is why I wanted to focus on Lehi, place of first landing. If you take the Book of Mormon, which I did, and I looked at this, and I started reading all these passages where they talk about shipping. As a, as a convert to the church, this was kind of a little troublesome for me because I knew the Hopewell were not coastal people. They lived in the heartland of America. They were inland, internal. They weren't out on the ocean shore. They are inside. And I'm trying to understand these passages, shipping, building of ships, and then especially in the Alma about Hagar and taking 5,000 people off in one direction at a time. I mean, this was, this was like, wow, ships. Didn't make a lot of sense. Squire and Davis come along, and they start surveying the Ohio earthworks. 
in the 1840s, which is a marvelous work. And if you look at the one, the big one there, this is what the survey looks like. And you can see there, there's the Hopewell structures, but notice the, the rivers. Look how big the banks are. Those banks can be over from 30 to 60 feet in depth down to the present day water line. We now know the interior of North America. The waters were deeper and wider. The Hopewell were using the river systems of this country as their highways. That's why they can talk about ships, building of ships, and shipping, even stuff all the way up into the land of desolation, into the North Country. This place looked a whole lot different during Book of Mormon times. And so now here we are. This is today. This is what we have today. That was Book of Mormon, and there's today. So in 1994, I've been doing my magazine for one year, and this gal calls me up in Mississippi and tells me she's got an interesting site with a lot of strange stones. I go down to the Pearl River in Mississippi, and I see these stones, and it was, and they covered a large area, about as big as the, the, the pulpit up here. And uh, what caught my attention were the holes, the stones with the holes. And this bothered me for a long time. And then I saw one that was very unusual. And I did, of course, I didn't know what it was, but you can see it's got bevel edges. There was writing on it, but of course, it's all weathered. It's all gone. I didn't know what this was. It took me a long time to find out. And when I realized that these were stones had come from ships, this right here is a signature stone. They're very rare. The captain and the pilot of the ship, their names would be on this. It was also used as an anchor. You can see there's a, there's a hole. Uh, right down here, it's, it's busted off, but there's a hole right there. And these are stones. This one right here, we have to this one, it's got to be at least 300 pounds. And uh, brothers and sisters, I can tell you, this was not made for a birch bark canoe. These guys had some big ships, stuff we can appreciate. So then I go to the Mediterranean, and I look and I find out, hmm, they got limestone with Double holes, single holes, some triple, they're rare. And then I looked up this here and I found out types of anchors. This is all in the Mediterranean, starting about 2000 BC. They just took irregular limestone blocks of one, two, three, four, 500 pounds, punch holes through them, and just use them for anchors. Look at this one up here. This one is just grooved. That's all it was, no hole, only grooved. Of course, single hole double hole, triple, and this one here, this is very rare, a hole and grooved at the same time. I have never seen one of those in person. So I start checking around the Midwest. What do I find? Lake Superior. Look at that. A grooved anchor. This guy's 200 pounds. And my friend Scott Mitchin has two of these. One's from Lake Ogibik. This one's from Lake Superior. And then I got a friend in Kentucky, pulls up this. Limestone several hundred pounds, another Mississippi one. This one here, Ohio. I have a question mark because I've kind of lost track of this one. This could be in Kentucky, but, but I think it was Ohio. And Florida, Florida is covered in anchors. This guy here has it in his uh, garden. And if you go online, you can find this photo. These are in people's yards. Look at this right here. Here's the three holer. You can barely see it for the fern. This guy here used it to, uh, for his address, for his house, 5006. I mean, these things are huge. Look at the for sale sign. Look how big this thing is. Anchors, stone anchors, North America. Now, hang on to that. We'll be back in a minute. So Lehi's group, place of landing. We're told in Helaman, the Lord brought Mulek into the land north, and he brought Lehi into the land south. And for me, that's pretty plain. I can tell you, I, I have a whole talk just on Mulek. I can follow Mulek right into the St. Lawrence Seaway, and it's backed up by the Native Americans that live there, primarily the Ojibwa and the Potawatomi. And Lehi landed in the state of Florida because, first of all, Dr. Sorensen, who is a Meso supporter, him and I agree on this very important fact that the people who brought Mulek's company across, now this is not Lehigh, Mulek's company, they crossed the Atlantic Ocean. And you can take that same route, it'll bring you right up to the Gulf, 
either you go into the Gulf or you go right up the east side of North America and into the St. Lawrence. The Phoenicians were hauling tin in the BC time range back into the Mediterranean. They could have also gone the northern route up to England, and there was a northern cross and it'll swing you right over to Newfoundland. And that's the, that's the very same course that John Cabot took, who followed Columbus after to find this new land to see what it looks like. But back to Florida, these two cultures here are called uh, the Deptford phase. The red one is just a little bit younger than the yellow one. I like the yellow one because of what's there at Crystal River for the Hopewell material. But right here, this is the oldest Hopewell location in North America, and it's in Florida. It's the oldest. So if it's the oldest, I'm going to look here for Lehigh. So the first thing I thought about here, and it came to pass that we did begin to till the earth, and we began to plant seeds. Yeah, we put all our seeds into the earth from the land of Jerusalem. It took me two years to figure this one out. I thought, well, okay. If they planted their seeds, wherever they came, I felt that the Lord was going to make them arrive in the springtime, which means they would have left in the fall. And if they left from where they did, they would have left probably in November or October to hit Florida springtime, February down there, spring, not a problem, three months, three and a half months to get there. And so I looked at this area and I thought, what's the latitude of Florida? 31.7 degrees. Well, I just grabbed that latitude, went right around the globe to the promised land over there, right? What's the latitude of Jerusalem? Anybody know? 31.7 degrees. Did Father take care of Lehi? Yeah, he sure did. And there it is, 31.7 degrees right through Jerusalem. I mean, that's incredible. I, this just can't be by chance. This to me says it all. They were blessed. He took care of them. And we also find then ship nails. Now these are from the Mediterranean, so you can see what they look like. The Romans used them for crucifixion because the heads were huge, because oftentimes the skin of the hand and the feet would begin to tear the poor person hanging there from their limbs. And so they used these large ship nails. My friend Scott has a whole pail full of ship nails from Lake Superior right here. These are made out of copper. And this right here was something I did not expect. I always go looking for Native American support, but my Algonquin friends, they really hit the nail on the head. And this is incredible. Here's your reference. Now, this is 11 years before the Book of Mormon is available. Just think about that. It hasn't even happened yet. Look at this. Limestone quarries in Florida are believed to have provided anchors for ancient international sea trade. John Johnson, Indian agent of the Shawnee, reported in Algonquin tradition that they came to North America from across the Atlantic, I put that in, ocean, and that white people using iron tools inhabited Florida. Homer said that the Phoenicians anchored their ships with the help of a pierced stone. What do you think of that? Isn't that awesome? These anchors, Florida is literally anchor headquarters. You want to get a stone anchor, you want to try and buy one from somebody, go to Florida. They're, I'm telling you, they are everywhere down there. Everywhere. So here's the second point. Artifacts that support the Book of Mormon. We're going to look at 500 BC to 500 AD. And I'm going to start off with this one here. This was found in 1859 in Newark next to the Great Octagon. And uh, it has Hebrew on all four sides. It's believed to be some kind of a plumb bob, uh, the little notch there, you would hang it down that way. And so whatever they did, with it, we don't know what they did with it. But all four sides had, were translatable, and it was read by Hebrews of the day. But for me, I always, when I pick up an artifact, I thought maybe someday, just maybe someday, I could pick up an artifact and turn it over on the backside, and it would say, <laughs> Maiden Zarahemla. Wouldn't that be awesome? Here's the four sides, holy of holies, king of the earth, law of God, and the word of God, all in perfect Hebrew. Of course, for the scholars, nobody's here before Columbus. Therefore, somebody made this, and they planted it to deceive. So they have never accepted this. We've got 13 artifacts like this, solid, 
solid in the archaeological record, but they are not accepted by academia because Columbus was first, okay? Talk about cement. You talk to the archaeologists, they will tell you the cement on the surface was primarily gone, but when they undo some of the large mounds, they'll find oftentimes a cement floor under the mound. Sometimes, very few times in Squire and Davis's book, what they had to take the mounds apart, they would find it capped with concrete. And this is, this is Nephite concrete right here, Chillicothe. This guy here right on my magazine, he has an iron smelter in Virginia. He paid for all the work himself for a university to come and do the actual dig, do all the dating, very expensive, costing about $16,000. And it came out to be 150 AD, an iron smelter in Virginia. And I'll tell you right now, we have 28 smelters just in Ohio. And we can't get the professionals to look at them because they feel they were done by the French and the British during the French and Indian Wars. They won't even look at them. Here's for you ladies. The Nephites love their freshwater pearls. And that's where you find it. Two mounds, just two mounds produced 148,000 freshwater pearls. But what's really important about that at the bottom, sewn onto clothing, cloth, not buckskin, not leather. If you go to the museum in Columbus, Ohio, they have samples of Nephite fabric, Hopewell, stored in thin drawers. And the reason it preserved, because large copper plates were laying on the fabric and the carbonate of the copper preserved the fabric. And because of that, we can see samples of the fabric that these people actually wore. And I gotta tell you, some of their designs are pretty avant-garde. You'll be surprised. I was surprised, but they're very colorful. They like color. This is a fun one. This is the challenge. One of these lamps is from Ohio. All the others are from the Mediterranean. I want you to take a minute. Is it door number one? Is it door number two? One of these came from Ohio, off the Little Miami River. It's this one, number four. Is this not exact? There's no difference here, people. None. It is the same. I have three of these. This is a good one. This comes from the cave of the Potawatomi. And when you talk to the Potawatomi, they're very friendly people. I, I, I can take you to the reservation up in Michigan. They'll tell you this is a sacred symbol to them and it belongs to their ancient ancestors. Did you catch that? Ancient ancestors. What is this? Of course it is. In the archaeological record, this has been labeled a fanciful pitchfork. Now, I'm not making this up. That's the stuff we have to deal with in the Midwest. This here is a good one. Cyrus Gordon in America was a leading epigrapher of his time. Also, well-respected in Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East, anywhere. Well-respected. A friend of his, Henriette Mertz, saw a picture of this stone, which is called the Bat Creek Stone. Comes out of Cherokee country. The bones that were with it have already been dated. There were nine people buried with it, 100 to 300 AD. It's right in that area, Book of Mormon timeline. And the way you're looking at it right now, they call it Cherokee script. What you're looking at is upside down Paleo Hebrew. This is the correct way. This is Paleo Hebrew. Cyrus Gordon translated it. He says, right now, all it says is for Judah because the one end has been busted off. But he translated it. And when he got done doing that, the Smithsonian put it back on display upside down and said Cherokee alphabet. It, the stuff that goes on is incredible. I went and did a reverse on the stone. The coin to the left, unfortunately, the picture is poor quality, but all of the letters on that coin match the letters on the stone. And then I put another one down in the corner just to show what it looked like. This is a Jewish shekel from Jerusalem, 68, 72 AD. But what I want you to do 
there's a reverse now of the coins. So you can see the letters that are on the coin. Look at the letters. Tell me how well they match. What do you think? Are they not the same? The really strange happening, I had a scholar, and I, I won't tell you his name, but he's from BYU, and he looked at this. He said, this thing is written incorrectly. The letters have been made incorrectly, and they're not in the proper order. And I got to tell you, if Cyrus Gordon were alive, I would have put him on him in a heartbeat. But Cyrus is gone. This is incredible. It's a match. Here is the holy stone. This also was found uh, in Ohio, about 12 miles from the octagon in the largest stone mound of North America. The stone has covered the front, sides, and the back with the Ten Commandments. And there's only about four words different from the one out of the King James Version. It's perfect. This here was championed by good old Orson Pratt, who gave a talk on it right here, your Journal of Discourses, in volume 13 of the Journal of Discourses. If you got the set, you can go home and read it. My daughter and her husband were serving in Spain. There, he was in the military and had a, had a, a four-year stay over there. And before they came back, my wife and I, we jumped over so we could tour the area as best we could, having a place to work out of. I got to Rome, and I was going through Rome in the museum. Uh, this is at, uh, actually at the, uh, the Vatican. This is upstairs in the Vatican. And I'm walking along, and I see these two stones really caught my attention. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those and bring them forward really big. And then I'm going to put that Ohio stone right smack in the middle. And I want you to compare. What do you think? Is that not a parallel? You see, I can't say they're exact, but I can say they're parallels, that they are made the same, they look the same, they possibly are the same. But we can't say that for sure because we have no way to do that. Nothing is lettered, but there it is, very, very same. And don't let anybody tell you there's no elephants in North America. We got elephants all over the place. It's just they've been ignored. The important one is that upper right-hand corner, that's a painting the land was owned by a, a doctor, and his hobby was to paint. And he painted this mound. The circle with the opening is called a henge. The henges were built primarily by the Adena. Hopewell did a few of them, but they all used them. And then in the middle would be a mound of something, and here we have a mastodon. Now, how in the world is that possible? Even if they found the bones, they couldn't have done this to this shape. Somebody must have seen this. And we know for a fact that you can't have it both ways. If they did not see a mastodon to make this, then who in the world made this? How did this happen? The archaeologists went in here and they did a dig on the mastodon mound. And unfortunately, when they finished, they did not put it back together. So today, it's just a pile of dirt. You can still go there and they got a sign up, but they have not put it back together. Unfortunate. Now, there are several books that talk about this, the guys that did the work on the mounds. And here right here is the, the, one of the first ones. The mound builders, this guy feels, were contemporary with the mastodon. And then all probability, they tamed and used the powerful beast to haul heavy burdens. Uh, it was admitted by, and familiar with the pre, it was admitted that and all were familiar in, with the prehistoric discoveries that the bones of the mastodon and those of the mound builders are found in the same locality and in the same state of preservation. That shouldn't even happen, but it did. You're finding them side by side with the Hopewell people and the Adena. With that going on, that tells us that the elephants, those three types in the Book of Mormon, they had to be present in some way. And down here, what got this guy excited, he, he saw the copper relic that showed a mastodon in harness, hooked up leathers, just like a horse, to be used as a burden, an animal of burden. Unfortunately, I've never been able to find that. It's probably in a private collection. And uh, until it services, this is all we have from Dr. Frederick Larkin. He wrote this book on ancient man in America. And then in Arkansas, we got this great cave that shows cattle, cow. So here again, another question. How did the people here know to draw this if they didn't see one walking on the land? Or was it a sailor that 
Somehow got blown off course, landed in America, and he was so hungry for a good steak, he sat and pounded out a cow and wished he had a cow. I mean, somebody did this. Okay. They're still with us, but today we find them all in the Middle East, this particular type of cow. Dr. Stephen Jones and two of his colleagues who were not LDS did a terrific work on searching for the horses in North America after the ice age of 10,000 BC, when our scholars tell us the horses were gone from North America. They have proved that the horses remained right up even before the Spanish brought the first ones over here. The Native Americans had horses and in the journal of Lewis and Clark, when they are dying of starvation, and finally they meet the Native Americans out on the West Coast. They tell us that when the first time they see them, the Indians speak, and they've got their translator, Sacagawea, and she tells them that they are telling her that they, Lewis and Clark, are the first white men they have ever seen. And while they're doing that, they're sitting on horses. That's in their diary, horseback. In Ohio, you used to walk in and see this copper artifact. And it used to say bird of prey. I think, uh, Tom, you probably saw it when it still said bird of prey. It was quite a while thereafter. I was after him to, to take that off. What is this, people? Of course it's a parrot. Well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is that parrots were all over North America because the climate was different. We now know parrots lived all across. But by the time we got here, after the arrival of Columbus, all the parrots now were living in Florida because the cold line had dropped all by itself. Man didn't screw it up with climate change. It's just one of those things that happened, okay? <clears throat> here is the area of the parakeets. They live there year round, according to our, our specialists. And of course, the yellow represents the Hopewell area. For some reason, when they buried people, oftentimes the parrot and the parakeets became some kind of uh, offering uh, in the grave, and they were buried with them in the grave. That's why we have the bones, and that's why we know they're here. And we also have to have sheep in the archaeological record, and this comes out of a Hopewell uh, site on Kip Island, New York. We do have sheep so they can keep that sacrifice for the law of Moses. Very, very, very important. And then this is a big one here, too. This is a big one. They never say the word migration, but they tell us that the Lamites follow the wild beasts from the land south into the land north, the land north back into the land south for food. Well, what's happening? They're migrating. And what's interesting, there are no migrating beasts south of the Rio Grande. The only migrating beasts are in North America. And that you can take to the bank. That's an absolute. It doesn't fit. It supports the Book of Mormon for the Lamites chasing migrating beasts. Nevertheless, after many days, their dead, their dead bodies were heaped upon the face of the earth. They were covered with a shallow covering. If you find a battle mound, this is what they look like. It's uh, men, women, children, usually all thrown in together. Uh, usually there's a blow to the skull uh, taken care of. And Alma, how go, how go, how, excuse me, behold, how great was her disappointment. For behold, the Nephites had dug up a ridge of earth round about them, which was so high that the Lamites could not cast their stones and their arrows at them that they might take effect. Well, this took a while to figure this out. How do you cast an arrow? I didn't know about that special weapon called, what is it? Adlatl, right here. This is the choice preferred weapon of the Lamanites, the Atlatl. And this is the most common point we find in all of North America. And every picks of them calls them arrowheads. Well, that's okay, but they're Atlatl points. That's what they are. And then we know the Nephites had the bow and arrow, even though our scholars tell us the bow and arrow did not show up until six and 700 AD. Yet we know the Nephites had a beginning when? When they got here, 590 BC. I mean, incredible. And you get this out of Helon because it tells us the Nephites are shooting arrows at who? Good old Samuel. They're shooting arrows. They're not, they're not casting. So the Nephites are using the bow and the arrow. Lamanites are casting with the Atlatl. Choice weapons. Copper. 
We find a lot of copper. We know they mine copper. We know it was here all over the country, even float copper on the surface. This is cold hammered. This has not been smelted. If you find a cold hammered piece, our copper from Wisconsin and Michigan has an element of silver running through it. And if you find that, it doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet. And then you'll know this copper came from here, the Great Lakes. If it's not smelted, once it's smelted, all that goes out with the dross. And we also have, guess what? We got swords and we got scimitars. I can show you 10 private collections with swords and scimitars, but you won't see one in a museum anywhere in America. And here's why. And I did not realize this until I met this fellow. Walking his dog on the shoreline of Lake Superior, this thing, the tip of it was sticking up out of the sand. He just reached down and pulled it right up out of the sand. This beautiful sword. Canadian side, he goes to the museum in Toronto, gets a hold of the curator, and he makes his presentation. He says, look, here's for the museum. Put this on display. I know you don't have one. The curator was very polite, said, thank you very much. We thank you for your offer, but we don't want it. Native Americans did not make swords. Therefore, your sword has to be fake. Somebody planned it to deceive you. Thanks again and have a nice day. This goes on all the time. The good news is I'm in process of trying to buy this from him. And then I can bring it here and you guys can see it, okay? I'm on it. Breastplates, head plates. They fastened them on. Here's a typical head plate. This right here is the back of the crown of the head. This is the front. These are grommets. These here were over your ear. This would swing down to your jawline. And when the archaeologists first saw these coming out of the earth with the hope well, they either had cloth or leather cap holding this together. But once it hit the air, it literally just fell to dust in their hands. The copper is there, but the cap itself, how it was built, sewn, put together. They couldn't even get a, a drawing of it. It just literally fell apart. I have never found a drawing, but they all talk about head plates, just like in the Book of Mormon, head plates made out of copper. And they talk about breastplates. And this isn't like the one where it shows all your pecs, you know. Um, sorry, ladies. Uh, the Hopewell made three of these at a time, a large, a medium, and a small. It covered your abdomen. Uh, think of a, a, a shrimp or a lobster, the ectoskeleton on the outside, folded, overlapping. That's how they wore these. And notice the big hole. Take a knotted cord. You pull the knotted cord through that big hole, and then you cinch. Pull it through the hole, cinch. And then the, up here, the neck, this, is a, this would stabilize it on your chest by tying it around your neck, behind your head. Okay? Breastplates. Arm shields. You can't see this in the picture, but this arm shield, about every inch, there's a little teeny hole so it could be sewn onto like a jacket, like you put it on an old football uniform. You got your shoulder pads separate. Well, these were already built in. You just put it on your jacket because there's holes are there to be sewn onto some kind of cloth or buckskin, whatever they used. Arm shields. <clears throat> Alma, 45 and 18. Now, once in a while, we find something in archaeology we cannot explain, and it can be quite funny. We all know Alma Sr. leaves in the Book of Mormon. He goes off toward the city of Malik, and his son, Alma Jr., never sees his dad again. I mean, according to the book, we don't know what happened. But now I can tell you that son found dad, and they are buried side by side in the state of Alma. Are you ready for this one? Here they are. I had to, I, when I saw this, I had to slam on the brakes. I did a U-turn, I went back. This is Alma, Iowa. So if you want to go see it, that's where it is. So I'm telling you, okay? All right, Captain Moroni, 72 BC, in your Book of Mormon, it tells you he begins to fortify the cities throughout all the land. Fortify, 72 BC. This image you see down here, the posts, these are already taken up. They leave holes in the ground if, if they're lucky enough. The archaeologists can tell the size of the tree. This has all been rebuilt to show what it looked like. 
here's a tower, here's a tower, here's a tower, and the mounds inside are all back here on the tippy top of the hill. So this gives you an idea. This is in Wisconsin. It's just a, a, read, a put together, get some idea, a feel for it. And then, of course, we got these key scriptures that talk about places of resort, throwing up banks of earth, building walls of stone, Alma 49, depth of the ditch, 49 and 20. Place of entrance is really a big deal. And then timbers built to the height of a man, towers to be erected. And then on the bottom one there, big. They built some things that were very, very big. And this was confusing for a long time. Here's one of the best walls that are still preserved. This is at Fort Ancient. Uh, today it's 24 feet. Uh, they estimate it probably stood about 30 feet and then would have a timber wall on top of that. The orange lines represent where the ditch used to be. It's been filled in because where these guys are standing, this was all a cornfield at one time. It was farmed for quite a while. And here you can get an example how deep the ditches are. Would you not agree this is huge? When I see ditches like this, I think of our elephant in harness, bulldozers, diggers, whatever, doing a lot of the manual labor, a lot of the work. That's how I see it. And here again, they also used some type of plaster and even the concrete to cover the wood structure. Primarily, I would guess from weather, but also it'd be a good retardant of fire in case of trouble. And of course, the post molds, that's what I'm talking about there. If they survive at all, they're extremely helpful. If they burned, they're carbon, and now we can get a date off of them. Uh, otherwise, if they've gone to rot, we just find a stain in the, in the ground. And you have to be very careful when you're looking for post molds. They're very elusive sometimes. And so thus they were prepared to body their strongest men with their swords and their slings, smite down all who should attempt to come into the place of security by place of entrance. This right here has been preserved. Uh, this was going to be sold off for houses, real estate. It was privately owned. And uh, by golly, a bunch of us got together and we raised the money. We bought it. It's now in a trust. It has been preserved. And I would say probably another year and it'll be open to the public. You'll be able to go there and walk it. It's very good shape. And you want to see it. It has the door up there, which is important. And that's what we're going to focus on. This is the place of entrance. The blue guys are defending. The red guys are going to attack. So as they come, they can't go over the berm and the wall. So they, they leave the, the door open, like, come on in, right? And so in they come. Now what's happened to the red, red team? They're in a crossfire. The blue guys have got them really, really want them. They're in a crossfire. And if they have enough men to survive that, they're going to keep going. And they're still getting hit pretty hard. And if they can make it all the way to the opening, then they're going to be met by the blue guys who are standing there to plug that up. And by so doing, now we have that classic remark, shooting fish in a barrel. This lasted for the Nephites about 150 years, and it was very effective against the Lamanites, who outnumbered them usually. This was very effective. They forced them to fight on their terms, and that's what they did. This guy here, Robert Riordan, um, he's working on a site called the Pollock Earthworks. It's also very pristine, and it's wonderful because he now has identified that the enclosure itself is circular, and I'll show it to you in a minute, built upon a stockade of burned, sturdy logs. They had a fight here. It went down. This is the Pollock Earthworks. Notice the water where it used to be. See the little creek? Well, this is the banks all the way across, and it was so high, they have no wall here at all. The wall starts right here and goes around to there and stop. Notice here, cliff is 30 foot high right here. So this was easy to defend, but here it gets lower. So they got to put a wall and this here is their place of entrance. So there's your, there's your water. That's your back door. Here come the attackers. The green circle is where the back door is. And now you put in the water and now it all makes sense. They would look for places they could defend. But they had to have a back door in case they needed it. And that's where it is. This is the approach to the Pollock earthwork. This is what it looks like. You have to go in the spring because once this breaks out it would, with, with leaf cover, you can't see anything. You walk right past it. They covered uh, limestone flats to walk into the fort. Here I'm standing in the, the gateway. You can see the mounds, how big they are. They're really good shape. They haven't been plowed. They haven't been knocked down. That's the depth. So now what I'm going to do I'm going to take Photoshop and I'm going to put a wall on there and I'm going to put a tower on each side of the opening. 
and I'm going to drop in some limestone covering. Remember it said the Lamanites would try to dig the walls down, but they were unsuccessful. So there you go. The only thing here that is a complete guess is the door. We have no idea what the doors look like, if they had them at all. Place of entrance, tower, wooden stockade, bank of earth, flat limestone across the front. And then you go to Fort Ancient. This is what it looks like today. Those two big cones is where the tower stood. Going to do the same thing right there. Then I'll put them side by side so you can see it. Pretty aggressive. This right here, um, Robert Connolly and his associate came in and they got permission to sample all the way around. This, by the way, is almost four miles all the way around. That's how big this is. This is called the North Fort. This is the Center Fort. This is the South Fort. This was built by the Adena, who are our Jaredites. The Nephites later made this connector and then they built the North part. And they lived up here in a village which these guys are going to find is called the interior house cluster. But right here on all these walls, they found post molds all the way around. So this whole thing was posted every inch. But the house cluster is what's really important. Look at the dates. 390 BC, continual occupation to 380 AD. Book of Mormon timeline. And of course, 385 AD, it's over. So these guys did not evacuate until just five years to go northeast into the land of many waters, Camorra land. Okay. Carlisle is one of my favorites. Um, it's also been hurt the worst by uh, urban sprawl. Uh, there happens to be three Ohio communities uh, very close to it. And there was a lot of stone here. So the early pioneers that lived in Ohio here, they all sacked this fort for the stone on the walls. And they also had stone houses inside. And I've uh, never seen a drawing. I've tried to find it. I've looked in all the old books. Haven't found one yet. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Photoshop and I'm going to stick walls on the, see that slopey berm right there, just lopping along right on the edge. I'm going to put the wall right up here on the inside to take a look. There's the wall with the towers. Now, if you're a defender in that fort, are you going to leave all those trees stand out front for your enemy to take cover? No way. They got to go. So take away the trees. Now they can, the enemy is exposed. Okay. They come up close, they're going to get it. This is a tremendous help. What would you do if this was your place? You have built your fort. You've got who knows how many thousands and thousands of trees to go around it. And you've cleared off all the way around it, quite a ways down slope. What are you going to do with all the brush? You're going to burn it, right? Yeah. And they did. And guess what? It left a huge footprint for us to find to support the Book of Mormon. 100 BC is the timeline that they put the great burning at because as the water rains, as, the, as it rained, the water hits the ash down through the soil and where there were caves, it drips down to the stalagmites and the stalagmites then are identified by layer because each layer has carbon material and it's radiocarbon dated and know, they know exactly when it happened. And they're telling us that 100 BC, we got 72 BC in the Book of Mormon, but again, they're just starting. They're going to burn all those treetops. It supports the Book of Mormon beautifully. I mean, it's just great. And then they built these huge geometric earthworks. I mean, they're big. Big circle is 40. The blue one is 10, and the other one is 27.3. And no matter where they went, they could duplicate it and rebuild the same structure to these specifications. So they understood surveying. They understood geometry. They understood math. This is not a Stone Age culture with buckskin and moccasins running through the forests of North America hunting deer while the women are home pounding corn and acorn nuts, okay? This is a high society group of people. Now, remember the last one I told you how big it was? 
They built some large things. This is called SIPE or SEEP, the red right here. This is all SIPE or SEEP earthworks. The only thing here that exists is this large mound and these two berms are still here. Everything else is gone. But what the Ohio archeologists have done, which was really good, they turned all this into the prairie grasses, the natural grasses, and they only mow where the berms should be because from the air, using infrared photography, you can still see the outline of the entire fortification. And so you can go here, the grass is all nice and high, and you step inside here, and you know, path, you got open path to walk the whole thing. It's really impressive. I mean, it really is impressive. But now to scale, I'm gonna take these things on the outside, and we're gonna show you how big this thing is, okay? The Pyramid of Giza will fit inside the red square. Pyramid, how many people have seen the Pyramid of Giza? You've been to Egypt? It'll fit inside that square. There's the Roman Colosseum in the middle. There's a Stonehenge. There you go. So to scale, you can begin to appreciate how big these are. Now, what's interesting, what caught my attention, one part in the Book of Mormon, Lamanites attack the place of entrance and they take a beating really bad, but they are still able to push the Nephites out of the city. And it says that night, the Lamanites expected a counterattack. So they put all their forces at the place of entrance because they feel the Nephites now got to come back the same way and they're going to give it to them like they did to them the day before. Well, that night, Captain Moroni, he takes his whole army and so he comes over the west wall with ladders and ropes, right? And he lets down his entire army inside the city and the Lamanites don't know they're there. And at sunrise, they attack the Lamanites from behind and push them right out the door. The cities have to be large. And this would be a very good example. And then we have one like this. Again, I can't tell you this is the city of Lehi, but I can tell you this is a very peculiar or particular earthworks. There's nothing else like it. This one right here. Recognize that? Oil lamp. And a couple more things here. Okay. On the same page? Not sure. Yes. You're not sleeping, are you? Okay. Anyway, early in the 1990s, the United States Corps of Engineers came here and they leveled the whole thing. Now, the other geometrics throughout Ohio, they didn't touch. But this one they took down because it showed contact with the Eastern Hemisphere. You see, we're still establishing America. Can't have any entanglements. Nobody reaching across the seas to grab onto our turf. So all the foreign contacts have to go. They have to go. And then we've got all kinds of statements from Native Americans who talk about these things. <clears throat> this guy right here, Cornstalk, he's a very famous Seneca chief, well-known. He says that Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, at the country had been inhabited by a white people who were familiar with the arts of which the Indian knew nothing, that these whites, after a series of bloody contests with the Indians had been exterminated, he also stated the burial graves were of an unknown people, that the old forts had not been built by the Indians, but had come down from a very long ago, people who were of a white complexion. And then our Algonquin tradition, just like in the Book of Mormon, they still did it in historic times. They're going to go to war. They covered their foreheads in red. It's exactly the same as the Book of Mormon. It is no different. And then here we go. This one here is really neat, language. This comes from Brian Stubbs. He's at the Eastern Utah Blanding University. He said, the strength of language evidence is that if enough of it has been preserved to be demonstrated linguistically, then language is among the strongest kinds of evidence. Language families cannot be fabricated. Written records unearthed in the Americas are often labeled hoaxes, but language ties when apparent show specific ties from ancient to modern. And the thousands of speakers of the related languages are, again, beyond fabrication. Check this out. Old Testament, New Testament. Excuse me, Book of Mormon. Look at the names. What do we see on the end? The A-H, the ah, ah sound. This is what he's talking about. But this is all the same timeline. 
So let's take a look at some Native American names from chiefs of the Algonquin in the Ohio country. A-H, ah, this is exactly what Stubbs is talking about. This cannot be faked. This has carried over for 2,000 years in the verbal of those people. 2,000 years, can't be faked. And then we find even more. Ripley Ancom, we got this prefix. We find out a dictionary is compiled by the early colonists. The, for the word for river, I can't pronounce it, but it begins with R-I-P. The word for lake, the same, R-I-P. And then just to show, I put in for hill from the Book of Mormon, Ripla, and then Jaredite King, Ripla Kish. The prefix is big, great, large, Rip, R-I-P. Again, something else that cannot be fabricated. <clears throat> Anton transcript. Barry Fell comes along, and so did the Johnsons. They look at this, and they say, holy smokes. They all both knew about the Micmac uh, Book of Prayers. The Micmac live in Newfoundland, New Brunswick, in the state of Maine. That's where they hang out. And if you look at the, the, the comparisons, some of them are exact, but they're also very, very close. Would you not agree that these are very close? They found out that the children are running through the woods playing games on Birch Park, and they're writing down these characters, and they're, they're burying them. The kids are finding them, and they got some kind of a game going on. So the Jesuits got hold of this, and they got the, set the, the elders down, and they put together a catechism so they could preach, begin to teach the Algonquin people about Jesus Christ. That's what the Jesuits did in the 1600s. And along comes Dr. Fell. He said, it is evident the Micmac hieroglyphs much already have been transmitted to North America more than 2,000 years ago when they were still in use in Egypt. Boy, isn't that something? And then right here, the very first Bible in North America made right here in the 1600s was made in the Algonquin language, not in English. Algonquin, Lamanite. This is on display in the Smithsonian. And then I love this guy, a man, <clears throat> Glottochronology. He says, <clears throat> Glottochronology is an attempt to estimate how long ago two languages separated from a common ancestor by evaluating their degree of divergence on a list of key words. Linguists applied this technique to Algonquin dictionaries compiled by early colonists. The results indicated that the various Algonquin languages in New England all date back to a common ancestor that appeared in the Northeast a few centuries before Christ. This ancestral language may derive from what is known as the Hopewell culture. This guy is not a member of the church. I love this guy. I love this guy. Good book, 1491, New Revelations of the Americas for Columbus. I recommend it. Now we got some good parallels following the law of Moses. These are quite striking. Had a lot of fun with this. I was in on tour with the LDS travel at the time with Bruce Porter, and uh, we were in Israel. And this right here is Megiddo. And on the very top end, the archaeologists have, have cut away like giant steps, if you will, to show what's called each layer is a horizon of when a different group of people live there, uh, mainly, mostly Canaanites, sometimes Hebrews, but mostly Canaanites. So we're looking at this picture down below here. And the rabbi is telling us, uh, here's the difference between a, 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 um, a Canaanite altar and an Israelite altar. And uh, he said a few things. And we're looking at it. And this gal raised her hand and he said, uh, Rabbi Wallenstein, um, I can't tell the difference between the Canaanite altar and an altar of Israel. And he said, well, it's very easy. He said, the Canaanites, they always have steps or staircases going up to their platforms. That's against the law of Moses. We said, what? Against the law of Moses to have a staircase? Why? He said, well, because... Uh, the Lord says you can't see their, your nakedness. Well, we didn't understand that. I looked over to Porter, and I kind of rolled my eyes, and oh, Bruce. And Bruce is a scriptorian. He just, he just says, calm down, calm down. <laughs> so that night, we're on the Sea of Galilee in our room, uh, Hotel Tiberius, matter of fact, and uh, we're pouring through the Old Testament, and, and Bruce found it. And look at this here. Exodus 20, 26. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. You see, these guys were, were all wearing, you know, you know, skirts down to our knees. And so as they go up the staircase, right, well, the, the people are gathered at the base and they're looking up and they're seeing a man's privates because they're going up these giant staircases to, to do their worship service or whatever. Okay. And God says, can't do that. 
So the Israel, what the Israelites do, they built lower platforms and they strung it out with a long ramp, a long ramp to approach. So they didn't go up by staircase. Okay. Well, my first thought was this. I thought, boy, am I glad I'm not a Mesoamerica guy. How are you going to explain this? This is all over our paintings, our books, our church magazines. I mean, come on. This is, people, this is in violation of what I just read you. Complete violation of the law of Moses. And not only that, it makes it worse is that the dating is wrong. What are we doing? We're setting out bad imagery. So then I'm thinking of Ohio. Here's Hopewell, five foot, couple maybe at 10, mostly at five platform, and then 50, 60 foot long ramps to approach the top. And, this is, and their altars are not on top of their building. They're on the ground. Solomon's temple, the altar was not on the roof. It was down in the courtyard. So it, it, they're just all wrong. But then there's more. There's more. 25. If thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, cut. For if thou lift thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Well, I, I chased down all the anthropologists that would talk to me, and they told me there is not one natural stone altar in all of Central America. They're all carved. Very nicely done. Neat archaeology, but it's not Book of Mormon archaeology. Okay? We find it again in Deuteronomy. If thou built an altar unto the Lord, the altar of stones, thou should not let thy tool upon it. You have to use whole stones. It's in Joshua. Altar of whole stones. No man hath lift any iron upon it. So this is very important to the Lord to get this altar right. It has to be right or it's blasphemous. He won't accept it. So here we have a small altar in the desert of Arad. It's called the Temple of Arad in Israel. If you read the Ohio books, they talk about finding altars all the time under the mounds, but there's no drawings. Thank goodness I found one photograph. One, this is the only image I have of a Hopewell altar buried beneath a temple mount. And there it is. Natural stone. Is this not a parallel? I don't know how we can get any closer. Okay. Unless, of course, down the quarter, it said made by Nephites, you know, whatever. But there it is. Okay. Now, I got to have some fun with you guys. You've all seen this painting, right? Give me a yes. Yes. Thank you. I have to, because this really happened to me. It's if this painting were true, the way it stands right now, what was the date that Jesus came and visited these people? What was the date? I'll give you a clue. And why is that? What's that sitting back there? That's Chichen Itza. That was built in 900 AD. I was in only Illinois with a good friend of mine, an archaeologist. I got him to go to Sacramento with me. A lot of times I miss when I'm out in the field, but he, he went with me. We walked in the foyer, heading for the Sacramento room, and right there on the wall, just as big as life, this painting. I mean, you know, it was a big, it was a big one. I mean, it was like this, you know, like that. As we approached the door to go in chapel, he grabs me by the arm. He said, hey, Wayne, you didn't tell me Jesus came twice. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, look at that painting. I said, oh, man, I'll tell you, we'll talk after this afternoon. I'll tell you, let's go on. <laughs> but see, as he understood, he, he's, he's savvy. He understands the history, the archaeology. He knows what's going on. So we need to be careful. So what do you got to do? Now, if I, I do this and I say to you, what was the date that Jesus showed up and talked to these people? You see, because up above, he tells the Nephites, you know, I was in Jerusalem. And I told him I had other people, and that's you. And now I'm telling you, I've got more people to go see. He went everywhere. And he went down to Central America. He went to South America. So when did this happen? Right about 34 AD. There's nothing wrong with this painting. You just got to get rid of Chichen Itza. <laughs> Either cut it out or take a marker or do something. 
the painting is lovely. There's nothing wrong with it. But the temple's got to go. Okay? That's all. All right. I'm going to focus on Hill Cumorah, archaeology, ancient history, and tell the story. Of course, it's in plain sight. I love this prophetic thing here with uh, Governor DeWitt Clinton, 1812. If a knowledge of these ancient people is ever obtained, it will be derived from the inscription on stone or metals, which have withstood the rest of time. Boy, he has no idea what's coming. Interesting. And you see, in, in New York, they knew the western New York was covered. Over 200 fortified hilltops out there, just like Ohio. 200, 200. What's going on in Western New York? I love it when people tell me that are Meso supporters, they tell me there's no artifacts in New York. I'm, I got to tell you, you guys haven't looked. You just haven't looked. You can go back there. I don't care. Pick a town. Just pick a town and go into their archives. Look at their old papers if you want to spend the time. And in the, you'll find every one of them will talk about the fortifications, piles of bones, and artifacts found in the ditches and in the hilltops, covered, even on Hill Camorra itself. Kathy Burris and her father were working for the church when the church decided to put the tarred pathway, which has now been removed, diagonally all the way up to the top, and they did some work on top in the parking lot, way up there beyond the the statue. They witnessed pails of artifacts coming off the hill. Pails stored in the visitor center. All these have gone back to Salt Lake location unknown. Now, my question is, if I was in charge of Hill Camorra, you know, we go to battlefields and the weapons that were, that were used that day, they're on display. These points there should be a point display there to show what took place. And we've had two nations of people go down at Camorra. And yet that is not discussed. There's no points on display, nothing. So people say there's nothing there, but there is there. And then this guy, I can't even remember how I found this guy, but he was such a fine gentleman. He's really up in years. It's blocked. The letter behind there, he's, he's got a nice letter. He lives up Montpelier, up on the top end of Bear Lake. And he's really up in years. He's in his 90s. And I haven't talked to him since COVID. I, don't, he, I hope he's still with us. But he said, if someone wants to talk to him, he said, put my address out there. You can write me, and I'll write back. In the 1950s, when they first decided to do the Hill Camorra pageant, they had to dig three huge pits at the base of the hill to put the lights, to hide them with, with covers so the lights could shoot up the hill. He and these other guys in this letter dug the pits. In digging the pits, he says right here, he says, from memory, it was basically about two by four, four feet deep in the ground. As I told you on the phone, there was a lot of arrowheads per shovel full. You see that? Per shovel full. And then he said a special one caught their attention. They found a really neat ax, very strong. It was very unusual because they had files. The ground was so hard, they had to sharpen their shovels to be able to dig. And they took the file to this ax head, and he said, we couldn't even scratch it. Well, that came back to Salt Lake. Don't know where it is. Sad. Artifacts, they are plentiful. And here's the guy that surveyed those 200 forts in western New York. This is what the book looks like. He also talks about the bone pits. Gosh, everybody out there talks about the bone pits. It's, it's no big deal. We have Native Americans, especially in the Iroquois, uh, <clears throat> the Seneca in particular. This is uh, Elder Kennedy. He came to Wisconsin back in, uh, gosh, what was it, 92, and uh, visited with us at the Ancient Earthworks Society. He told us about the long ago, the confrontation of his people who fought another people of a lighter skin. They fought over who would control God. That's interesting. And he said, why was the fight so important? Uh, he said that it, it, it involved the Wapanu, which was their priesthood. And the Wapanu had their beginning when East Star Man came. Check that out. East Star Man came. And what did East Star Man do? He raised the dead, healed the sick, fixed the wounded, made the blind to see. East Star Man. His name in Algonquin is Dagana Wida. Dagana Wida is the companion to Hiawatha. 7, 800 AD, we don't know the exact time. That's when the wars ended in the east between the tribes because Hiawatha became 
a, some type of a, had a righteous vision of some type. And this special person called the Ganawida came down and assisted him. And the two of them were able to settle the land and cause peace. That's just a real quick Hiawatha story. The Ganawida, very awesome. Okay. So the big question is, one Kimura or two? Many are convinced that Kimura in New York cannot be the final battle location as this hill could not possibly hold 230,000 soldiers. And you know what? They're correct. A hill can't hold that many people. However, Mormon was the first position up front with his 10,000 men. The remaining 220 were scattered around the surrounding drumlin hilltops. Now here's the real catch. If you're an ancient historian reading battles, this is the giveaway. 610 of Mormon. And it came to pass that my men were hewn down, yea, even my 10,000 who were with me. And I fell wounded in the midst, and they passed by me that they did not put an end to my life. Brothers and sisters, I can tell you, true scholarship, if an enemy has one location to fight, and one guy is a complete conqueror, they do not leave the field. They stay there and they strip the dead of anything that's valuable and they collect their spent arrows. They pick up the weapons that are not broken. They don't leave. Anybody makes a moan or a grunt, they put an end to their life right there on the ground. And that's why this picture that you see here, the bodies are practically naked. They've been stripped because that's what they do. I don't care what country, what culture, what timeline. You win the field, you strip the field. It's yours for the taking. Because then you have to go after the, what's called the baggage area. That's all the supplies that follows the army along. That's the real prize. That's where you find the coin and the jewelry. And women, baggage. Okay. But what does he say? They passed him by because they went to the next fight. They moved on. That's my point. They moved on. And we're going to hit some more on this. And when they had gone through and hewn down all my people, say it was the 24 of us, we haven't survived the dead of our people. We did behold on the morrow, and the Lamanites had returned to their camps from the top of the hill, Camorra, the 10,000 of my people who were hewn down, being led in the front by me. How many people is he looking at from the top of Camorra? 10,000. He's not seeing 230,000 guys. They're spread all around Camorra. And we've got the archaeological data to prove it. Heber C. Kimmel, The Life of, written by his grandson. He's when they'd gone through and hewn down the 24, the 10,000. He talks about how his father, Bosley, who was a blacksmith in this book, right here, he went around to these various towns of Avon, Bloomfield, Victor, and Manchester. These are all next to Camorra. And by searching the earth, he picked up enough iron artifacts. The book says here he never had to purchase raw pig iron. It's hard to believe that that iron would stay that long, but that's what they claim. They never picked up the raw pig iron for his blacksmithy. Didn't have to. They picked up, boy, Matt, I like seeing the artifacts he destroyed. Wow. So we're going to take a look at that. Also, they tell us that the hill Camorra had a trench entirely around it, a trench. So I took this area. Notice where it says the word many. There are many forts in that area by county. There's so many, some of them they can't even count them all. And then, of course, I looked at uh, the towns. Hill Camorra, I've identified right there is Bloomfield, 20 miles away. There's Victor at 15. Manchester's the closest at seven. Avon's 42 miles away. Now, I can tell you for sure if he's picking up iron artifacts in that kind of plentiful area, there had to be a battle of some type at those four locations. And not just there, there were other locations. The guys in Manchester could have joined Camorra in a one-day fight. They're close enough. Avon, 42 miles away, not a chance. There's no way they could run that distance to join in on a fight on the same day and be there. Not going to happen. These guys are picking off the fortified areas because they're encircling Camorra. And that's what the archaeological record will support. And I'll show you some more of that just in a minute. And then we have this right here, J. Golden Jensen. He puts out this book. He talks about a survey done by none other than James Talmadge. That's our apostle, James Talmadge, who was a geologist by profession. 
He concluded that the soils of the surrounding areas be very rich in calcium and phosphate content, which was human bone. Now, this test, this information, unfortunately, has never surfaced. So our naysayers for Camorra have not accepted this letter, even though it's out there. And we got good men talking about it. And as you look at Camorra, they find the white dust two to three miles out all around. I mean, this is a huge area showing there's fights going on all over, not just at the hill, but other places as well. Four years ago, I was in Layton, Utah, talking about this very thing. This family came up, this uh, Ellis people, and they said, our grandfather and great uncle worked the farm at Camorra back in the 50s, and they broke ground on a piece of virgin soil that had never been turned, and they kicked up a white powder, and they sent the white powder into a, a government office, and it came back, the white dust is decomposed human bone. Now, we have this complete test. It's been preserved. They live in Provo, so they're close by. So if anybody wants that, I can get it to you. They've got it. They're super people. So here's my conclusion. Based on the archaeology and the Book of Mormon account by Mormon, my personal conclusion in the final days is that it was numerous locations, numerous battles, and it took many days for the Lamanites to eliminate the Nephites as a nation. It was not a one-day event. There's just no way, because the archaeology will tell you differently. And then we had some fun. Matt. Matt is working for the church. He's a camera crew. He's taking what we call B-roll film, just extra film that they've got. They call it it's film in the can that they can pull out and look at if they're doing some kind of a movie or video on any type of topic that involves Palmyra. So while they're there, they got the families got to bring their children. Their children are running the hill of Camorra, plain. And that night, one boy did not return. Couldn't find him. Massive search in the night, out flashlights, and they finally found a hole. This collapsed, and this boy fell 11 feet down into the earth. 11 feet. Luckily, he was okay. Put a rope down there, pulled him out. They took these pictures, and I'm going to show this up here because it's uh, right here. It's better. There. Notice the wall. It's laid up limestone. If this were a cave, it would not be laid up limestone. It'd be the cave wall itself. But you see, Camorra is, and by geologic terms, is a pile of junk. It's been a deposit by a glacier. So it's big stones, little stones, sand, rubble, just gravel. It's, it's not safe. If you had a cave in there, it'd be very dangerous to go in there. So whatever is in there for a room holding the plates, it's got to be man-made. And because they had the, the cement capability, that's not a problem. It's got to be very, very nice. But here you can clearly see laid up stone. So I said to him, I said, what, what, what about, did you guys go in? He says, no, we didn't go in. I said, what, are you crazy? You didn't go in? I said, you couldn't have kept me out of this. I would have jumped. Last word you heard from my, my word is Geronimo, and I would have jumped in. He said, well, we didn't do that. I said, okay, so what happened to the hole? Well, he said, phys the physical facilities reps came and put a big iron plate over it. And they threw dirt over it, a bunch of trees. Now, Matt's telling me this on a bus tour, run a bus. You know, and I, I wanted to stop the bus, turn around and go back to Camorra. So anyway, it was about two years passed before I got back to Camorra. They were back here at the same time because they're part of the Willard Bean family. And they were doing some filmmaking for the Willard Bean story. That's the fighting preacher. You know what that is. And so we went up there. He took me to the spot. And I had my pole. And by golly, that steel plate was still there. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, man. You know what? I said, hey, guys, I need two guys with strong backs on a full moon and two crowbars. And we're in in 30 minutes. Who wants to go? Okay. But... I came back in three years, went to the spot. They have filled it in with dirt. It's all filled in. But I still know where it is. But it's all filled in now. No more iron plate. That was such a thrill when they had that plate. Gosh, it's interesting. I couldn't believe they didn't go in. I just, oh. Anyway, OK. Now, uh, Talmadge, another good thing he did, he became very good friends in Ohio with the Ohio State archaeologist, William C. Mills. 
Now Mills, he has no GPR. He has no infrared photography. He doesn't have a drone in the sky. He has no carbon-14 dating. Strictly dirt archaeology, hands-on. And look what he said. If you take a peek, he said there were two distinct peoples representing two cultures, a higher and a lower. They were in a state of hostility during Hopewell timeline. The lower culture being more commonly the aggressor and the other culture being a defender. What kind of a fight did the Nephites fight? They fought a defensive campaign. So from a careful culling of the data, he said you could follow these guys. He said it, it begins in the east, or excuse me, the west, and they're moving in an easterly direction. Now, this, this, this is 1917. This guy's talking. He's not even a member of the church. And he says, this is where they go. And they just kind of roll out of Ohio, and they just disappear. Well, we know what happened. We know who these people are. It's Camorra. The war begins at 322 A.D. at Zarahemla and ends at 385 at Camorra. Okay. 421. 21, Moroni comes back, says farewell. It's one of my favorite reads. But then along comes Arthur Parker, half Seneca. He's an archaeologist by profession, and he tracks the Hopewell. And not only the Hopewell, he tracks the Iroquois nation who are following the Hopewell into New York. And then he says, in western New York, we find that the Hopewell are here for the shortest period of time, but they have left the largest footprint in the soil. And why would that be? Because when they rolled out of Manti and Zarahemla and picked up the rest of the towns on their way, moving to the east, they knew they weren't coming back. So as the old cliche goes, they took everything they could but the kitchen sink. And that's why we have this huge horizon of Hopewell artifacts in Western New York. And they were there for the shortest time. Doesn't make sense in the archeological record, but when you read the Book of Mormon, we know the answer, we understand why. And this right here, <clears throat> this guy here, Murray Rawson, mission president out there with the Seneca and the Iroquois. They told me about the great war that was fought around the Great Lakes that they fought a people of lighter skin. They won the fight, but he said they were very embarrassed. And Murray asked the chief, why are you so embarrassed? He said, because our history is on a book. It's buried in a hill, and we don't know which hill. That's Buffalo Tiger. Murray brought him back to Salt Lake, introduced him to Spencer Kimball, and Buffalo Tiger got baptized. True story, true story. So final comments. What did Joseph know? In the beginning, there was one hill. Oliver Cowdery put out eight letters under the direction of Joseph Smith. And in letter seven, he fully identifies the New York Camorra as the correct hill. There is no second hill. It's called letter seven. It's in our church history. Go get it and read it. We don't even talk about it, but it's there. Parley P. Pratt, two years after Joseph was gone, he nails it. He said, there's a hill called Camorra, situated Ontario County, township, Manchester, state of New York, North America. Is there any doubt what he's talking about? Parley P. Pratt, who was a shadow to Joseph. Joseph's own mother talks about, boy, this would have been a home evening, right? How this Joseph sat down, he would describe who these people were, how they dressed, how they rode, how they fought, the buildings, how they built their buildings and everything. And then we've got down below here, we've got uh, Taylor and Woodruff talking about all the visitations that they had personal knowledge of that Joseph received by heavenly visitors, and he was taught about the ancient ways. And Brigham Young, of course, talks about in the Journal of Discourses how the great cave at Camorra and what I really like about this here, it says uh, in the green, the first time they went there, the sword of Laban hung upon the wall. The first time, well, how many times did they go in? What did they see? Wagon loads of plates, wagon loads. Now I'll tell you a true story. My first time at Hill Camorra, it was in the spring of the year, April. And it was before I knew about the metal plate, otherwise I would have dug it up. 
My wife and I, we get there, terrific wind-driven rainstorm going on. We're inside, the, we're, we were the only ones there in the visitor center. We got a tour by a lovely couple, went through. And then we stood at the door looking up at that tarred path going up the top. And the rain's coming down almost horizontally. And uh, the guy said, uh, he was listening to us talk. We, we said, gee, we hold our umbrella. We're going to get soaked. It's not going to matter. And the guy said, well, you know, you can drive up there with a car. Well, I didn't know that. So we ran down to the car. We got in. We drove around back of the hill all the way up to the top by the monument, parked the car. We got up there, and the rain stopped. Guess what's in my trunk? Metal detector. So I popped out, popped my trunk. I'm pulling out my metal detector. I'm running down the path toward the statue of uh, Moroni, and I hear the window down. My wife hollers, you're going to get struck by lightning. I got to tell you guys, my metal detector needle was buried. It was off the charts, the scale. I couldn't see it. There's stuff there. I am totally convinced there's stuff there. Then our own Doctrine and Covenants and History of the Church, Volume 1, 118 to 120. Joseph Smith sends Oliver, Parley, Zeba, and Peter to preach the gospel to the Lamanites in the West. Now, not our Western states. He's talking about the Ohio country, because that was called the Western Territories in his time. Revealing to them the sacred book with the history of their forefathers. And they went to Catarugas, the Wyandots, the Shawnee, and the Delaware. And they hooked up with these guys also out in the West when they got moved. And I love this one, Seton, Rochester. Joseph gave him a complete write-up to be published, which he had agreed to do. And when the paper came out, it wasn't there. Just one little couple of lines. And Joseph writes this letter back to him. He says, dear sir, I was somewhat disappointed on receiving my paper with only a part of my letter inserted in it. The letter which I wrote you for publication, I wrote by the commandment of God. And I'm quite anxious to have it all laid before the public. Well, it never got published. But here's the important part that I pulled out of that letter. We have a copy of the letter. The Book of Mormon is a record of the forefathers of our Western tribes of Indians. By it, we learned that our Western tribes of Indians are descendants from that Joseph who was sold into Egypt and that the land of America is a promised land unto them. Not Western Hemisphere, not America's, America. And I like this one too from the Wentworth letter. Guy visiting him out of Chicago. The principal nation of the second race fell in battle towards the close of the fourth century. The remnant are the Indians that now inhabit this country. Joseph standing in Nauvoo. And when he says country, what do countries have to have? Borders. So what's he saying? He might have just said USA. That's what he's talking about. America, United States of America. You want to get more on Joseph? Here's where you find it. All these stories will give you a whole bunch of information on Joseph. And I love Hugh Nibley. The Book of Mormon is a history related primitive church. One may well ask what kind of remains the Nephites will leave us from their more primitive, virtuous days. A closer approximation to the Book of Mormon picture of Nephite culture is seen in the earth and palisade structures of the Hopewell and Adena culture areas than in the later stately piles of stone of Mesoamerica. Dr. Nibley. First Nephi 22, 7 and 8. And it meaneth that the time cometh that after all the house of Israel have been scattered and confounded, that the Lord God will raise a mighty nation among the Gentiles, even upon the face of this land, and by them shall our seed be scattered. And after our seed is scattered, the Lord will proceed to do a marvelous work among the Gentiles, which shall be of great worth unto our seed. Wherefore, it is like another being nourished by the Gentiles and being carried in their arms and upon their shoulders. Second Nephi 10, 10 through 12. But behold, this land, said God, shall be a land of thine inheritance, and the Gentiles shall be blessed upon the land, and this land shall be a land of liberty unto the Gentiles, and there shall be no kings upon the land who shall raise up unto the Gentiles, and I will fortify this land against all other nations. Now, really, are we talking about Guatemala? We're talking about the Yucatan Peninsula? Think about that for a minute. For me, as a convert to this church, when I read about the promised land from the journal discourses and all the other books from the brethren and from the scriptures, 
To me, the promised land has to hold the Garden of Eden. Adam lived there. Adam on the Amun is there. Enoch lived there. Noah lived there. And as I go through my Book of Mormon more carefully, I find a nation of Gentiles is to be a land of liberty, a land to be a free nation. The new Jerusalem is going to be built upon that land. No kings are allowed. Nations are going to flow into it, and it's going to be protected against all other nations so long as we are a righteous nation. Now I got one more clue in case you don't know what I'm talking about. After this, I can't help you. This is absolutely the last clue. You ready? Does that help? In the beginning, there was one hill. I am a one hill guy. And I report and you decide. Boyd? Well, we're in the chapel, otherwise I think we'd all applaud. Um, yeah, we can do this. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. That was uh, tremendous. And uh, we do have a few minutes for a, a few Q questions if you'd like to ask Wayne. Uh, and then we're going to close with a uh, closing prayer by Doug Petty. Wayne, do you want to take a couple of questions? You have some questions out there? Trace? Sure. Nice and loud. Sure. Uh, you said that the biggest uh, argument against the book was that against the LDS stuff, the dark elements, and because of, they said they don't know that much, but now they have been proven journeys, maritime journeys, and from the people's information, et cetera. Do they, do they just deny that? Because uh, number, number B, part of that is, has there been any movement from these the only one that's gone public and of all places which is a surprise was one of the curators at smithsonian he now is saying that travel coming across the atlantic bumping on the islands and the ice sheet is definitely plausible and they had to come here by boat they're just starting to talk about boats but it's still a prickly pear because they teach isolationism. Nobody here before Chris. I mean, that's just, it's just staunch. And we have John Wesley Powell to thank for that dogma. He started it and it's still with us today. Where do you think the land, the, the ark of the land was? Okay. <clears throat> Book of Mormon says that where the, where the narrow neck is, that the sea has to divide the land. We get that in the ether. When you look at Panama, the land divides the sea. You can't count the, count the canal, okay? The sea does not divide there. It's, it's land. But at Niagara, the Native Americans call Niagara the narrow place. And we can find that in Algonquin records in the 1700s, way before Joseph shows up. So they recognize that as narrow place. However, it could also be where Detroit, Michigan is. Because wherever it is, the narrow place, it says that the Jaredites built their capital city next to this divide where the water flows from one to the other. We have never found anything large in the Niagara Peninsula, but where Detroit, Michigan sits today, that was a huge Adena city that was totally leveled by Detroit as they built up their city. And we just have, the information on that is just like next to none. Uh, nobody surveyed it, no drawings, um, hardly anything in the records at all. So for me, it's either going to be Lake St. Clair coming down from Lake Huron to Lake uh, Erie. That, that's one break, or it's got to be at Niagara, one of those two. Way in the back. The, the last I heard, the Hopi are showing about 5 to 7% Israelite DNA. They do have some. Um, you know, it, it could have got there anciently. It could have got there later from mixing. It's hard to say. We don't know for sure. 
But a lot of people think that the Navajo are very old. The Navajo are, are young. They showed up around 1200 AD. They're not, they're not that old. So don't get them confused. The Hopi have been here a long time. The Navajo have not been here long. The Aztecs are not that old. They showed up in Mexico 1100 AD. And people think they're as old as the, the Inca and the Maya. And no, not, not true, not true. They're, they're youngsters in the archeological record for North America. Yes. You mean what? How, how do they explain their? Oh, okay. <laughs> they, um, it's called silence. Um, did anybody have uh, the 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 uh, Salt Lake Tribune? Is anybody a subscriber to that? Okay. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> They did, they came on and did an interview with me in Wisconsin. And that interview got published. Um, let's see, it'd be uh, just a week ago. And if you want a copy, I will send you a copy to read. It was a hatchet job on the heartland. And what, what really, the thing that really, and I, and I knew it was coming by the way they talked and, and, and I didn't care. I just wanted to, even though it's bad publicity, that Tribune is reaching a lot of members who don't, have never heard of the heartland. I said, who are these guys? Maybe they'll come around and check us out. That's how I looked at it. But they, they, they went back to 2006 to find three people to hatchet the article who have been on my case since 2006. They have no, no new blood would step up to the plate. No Book of Mormon Central people would step up to the plate to criticize the article. They went back to 2006. Brent Gardner, uh, Fetter, who is an archaeologist, and then uh, Bolnick, who is a geneticist. All those three have been around since 2006, and uh, they don't have very nice things to say. So uh, but it's out there. So if you want it, um, you can get my email, and drop me a line, and I'll, I'll send it to you. Yes? Really? You actually wrote him a letter? Uh, what'd they say? But did they admit it was there? Okay. Oh, sure. Well, let, let me tell you the rest of the story. I, I asked Matt, I said, is this the only photo you have? He said, well, no. He said, we put the camera down the hole and just kind of turned it around. He said, we could see a doorway in the back where it continued. And he said, there were shelves on the wall, nothing on them, but there were shelves. I said, Matt, he said, he said, Wayne, I can't publish that. He said, I'll, they'll be on me like, like bees on honey. He said, I can't take it. And I said, I understand. I understand. But that's what he told me. So it's not a well, but that's okay. I'm glad you got, glad you got hollow. That's great. Well, put it this way, we, we know where the foundation is for the Zarahemla Temple. I'm totally convinced we got it. And uh, we raised money, oh golly, in 2000, 2014, we bought the place. There's about 10 owners that all chipped together. And uh, we now are purchasing uh, the nine acres in front of us. And then we, our, our view to the Nauvoo Temple never be blocked. As you stand on the block of the temple where it stood, it lines up. It's about a one degree off a of dead center to the Nauvoo door. And we've had it surveyed, and the, the surveyor said that kind of uh, connection doesn't happen by accident. He said it was probably some deliberate thing going here. And I said, well, okay, that's cool. But now uh, we just finished a week and a half's work at Zarahemla. Uh, if, if you know what it looks like, it looks like a big kidney shape. It's got a huge berm on the back, and it's all forest covered. We spent $30,000 last summer, and we had a plane fly over, and we shot LIDAR, about 20,000 acres. 
We have so much data right now, we can't even begin to scratch the surface. But we went to one farmer's property, one, and we found enough berms to go, well, to continue on, it's a four and a half mile stretch. But on his property, we've got a tree right on the middle of the berm, 144 years old. And the berm is five feet high with a 20 foot base. We got berms. There has to be walls. If we got Zarahemla down in the flat, that whole bluff area that's raised up, there would have to be a wall all along that top of the area to block the, the Lamanites who are living in the west, according to the Book of Mormon. And we, we got good berms. We got great stuff, good stuff. So it's, we're progressing very, very slowly. We have a 501c3, I might add. So anybody wants to make a donation, get a hold of me. Tax write-off. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, basically, we, we know they traveled by ship. It was by rivers. The rivers, that they were so uh, big and beautiful. It, it, they're a lot different from today. That's why I'm very, I'm very edgy to start naming waters and, and lands. We can get some general areas and general ideas. But you got to remember, this place got hit pretty hard at the crucifixion. And we just don't know how much changed. So we need to be careful about that. But uh, what's interesting... In Omni, I was in a Book of Mormon class, and right there, they're talking about how Mosiah, the Lord tells Mosiah to bring people from the land of Nephi, and it says to take them down to Zarahemla. Check your scripture, down to Zarahemla, okay? And so they go down to Zarahemla, and while they're at Zarahemla, they have a little bit of internal strife, I suppose, mingling with the, you know, the, the Mulekites, the Nephites. Things weren't, weren't totally rosy. And some Nephites decided they wanted to go home, back to the land of Nephi. And when they said that in Omni, it said, now we're going to go up to the land of Nephi. We're going to go up to the land of Nephi. And when I saw that in Book of Mormon class, the light went on, which was awesome. Unfortunately, my keys were in my wife's purse. I said, "Hannah, I want the keys to the car. She said, why? I said, I'm going to skip priesthood. What are you going to do? I got to go home and look at something. She said, no, you're not. You stay in the priesthood. So I sat there for an hour and vibrated. I knew what was going on. And as soon as I got home, I pulled out the book on Iowa and the book on Tennessee. Tennessee, elevation, 3,800 feet from the, from the Smokies, where we got the land of Nephi. Iowa along the river, three and 600 elevation. These people are moving by the elevation or the hydrology of the land. And so to check that out, I jumped into the Testaments. If you're in Jerusalem and you go to Capernaum, guess what? You go down to Capernaum. You go to Bethlehem, you go down to Bethlehem. You can check it out, you won't miss. When, when Lehi goes to the desert to get away out of Jerusalem, he goes down to the Red Sea. And when he sends his boys back to Jerusalem, they go up to Jerusalem. It's all elevation, and it works perfect. It's perfect. So they understood that, but the land was important to them. They understood ups and downs very, very clearly. Well, <clears throat> when the Jaredites came into the St. Lawrence Seaway, it's very possible they would have seen the very end of Lake Nipissing, which means Huron, Erie, and Ontario were all connected, which means they sailed in within about 50 miles of the city of Columbus because the, sh the water from the, the Lake Nipissing came that deep. If you go to Ohio today, you find all these wonderful mounds for the Jaredites and the Nephites, guess what? There's nothing in northern Ohio because it was water. It's not there. It's all flat water. And you can see the old shorelines. They're all there. So when they came in, they saw that. We also know that at that time, that body of water, those three lakes we have today, was all draining out the St. Lawrence. But 
Lake Michigan and Lake Superior were tipped to the west and they drained out of the St. Croix River for Superior and the Illinois River for Lake Michigan. But not today, isostatic rebound has picked up Michigan and Superior and now they're tipped back to the east. So today the Great Lakes entirely flows out the St. Lawrence Seaway. Okay, a lot of change, a lot of change affected. If you come to the Leighton Deal, I will show you where the Jaredites hung out for the thousand years they mined Upper Peninsula. We just found it, took us six summers. We got their camp and I'm gonna show it Thursday at Leighton. So if you wanna show up, love to have you. Yes. One more time now. Where can we get information about the activities in Lake this weekend? Okay. Boyd, can you take care of that? Give, give her your email? Or? Yeah, I'll just say bookofmormonevidence.org. Is that, is that good enough? Bookofmormonevidence.org? Yes, sir. I grew up with the Allegheny Mountain Oh, you did? And one of the most beautiful places I can find in my travels is Miami, the Miami River, is mine. Yes. You can see up in Washington, sunrise and sunset. Yes. Now, incredible evidence that so much is taken from that mound, the Smithsonian built, and then buried it. Yeah. With the cat's bones and then the bones of the people. But my question is, in 2024, another total eclipse is going to come to put an eclipse. I, I have nothing to that, but I know it's going to cross over Maconda, Illinois. And that's where I'm going to be with a bunch of people. We're going to be at Maconda. Uh, it's, we're, we're going to get a good one right there at Maconda. What's at Maconda? One of the stone forts built by Governor Laconius when they gathered for seven years to fight off the Gadiantons. That's where the forts run all the way across Southern Illinois. We got 41 forts that cut off Southern Illinois, the whole tip. I've been to 15 and they're, they're awesome. They're just awesome. Uh, two, three, three of them are state parks. You can actually find them. Yes, sir. Are you still involved with the Phoenicia? Are we still involved with the Phoenicia? Oh, yeah, we bought it. Yeah, we're involved right up to here. Uh, we have half of it is in Iowa. The other half is still in England waiting to come over. So uh, it's going to be a long project. Uh, we got to put it back together. It's been dismantled. So um, um, we got some pretty brave guys. That's all I can say. <laughs> What's that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Boyd, good. Okay, closing prayer. Who's our guy? There we go.